Hi everybody and welcome to a special edition of CYT Crypto. My name is Stephen Aitchison. Today I had the pleasure of interviewing Alexander Kravets, who's the CEO and co-founder of XTRD, or Xtrade. So I'm going to play the interview for you just now and hopefully we'll get your comments in the video down below as well and let me know what you think. I've been following Xtrade for a while now and I like what they're doing and I like how they're kind of going about things, kind of very methodically and just getting things into the market with the fixed API and their Xtrade Pro platform as well. They've got a lot of things coming out. They've got four main products coming out and I think it's going to be great for institutional traders and traders alike as well. So let me know what you think of the interview in the video down below and I will catch you soon. Namaste. Take care. So Alex, thank you very much for joining the show. Really, really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man. I know you're kind of uh, traveling and stuff like that as well. So thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, sure, Stephen. Great to be here. Thanks for taking the time to uh, conduct the interview and uh, be happy to answer any questions you uh, you might have and hopefully uh, give more uh, kind of granularity about what we've been doing at X-Trade and what's going on in the next few months. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's what we're looking for here. So can you just take a few minutes just now just to take us behind the scenes and give us your story? I kind of know what your story is, but I'd love our viewers and our kind of listeners to know the background about how you got into the crypto space. I know you're in the financial world, but if you could give us kind of like in your own words, um, words where you kind of come from and how you got into the crypto space as well, that'd be brilliant. Sure. Um, so I started off as a, a trader. Uh, basically, my friend got a job trading and got me a job trading. I was 20 or 21 uh, in like Flushing, Queens behind the supermarket. Uh, and so uh, we literally just uh, learned how to trade by ourselves. We uh, The guys had us in front of a computer and said, hey, make money or you're fired. And that was kind of how we... <laughs> We started to make money because otherwise we had to be uh, had to do other stuff. Uh, and so uh, I did that for a while. And then uh, the firm kind of started growing, became more of a clearing firm, a broker dealer, a market data vendor, because uh, we basically took the tools that we used to trade and offered them to people, um, you know, uh, on a service basis as opposed to just trading for ourselves, which is where we started. And so that went probably for about 12 years. And so I, uh, I became a managing director of the firm and grew from like five people to like, I think at one point, almost 200. Wow. Uh, and so, uh, you know, literally ran uh, as the firm grew, I literally like had to put on more and more hats. So, so now I'm the customer service guy. Now I run the trade desk. Now I run, now I run like the regulatory uh, liaison portion. Now I uh, implement market data for New York Stock Exchange. So things of that nature just kept happening. And I just kept like, uh, forcibly being made to do more and more work, which was kind of not fun at the time. But now I look back and uh, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and so uh, get out of the brokerage space uh, probably uh, around 2013, 2014. I got into more uh, personal trading, some other uh, ventures that I, uh, I got into. And I uh, started trading crypto uh, in 2017 and sort of, sort of immediately saw um, the inefficiencies inherent in trading. So there's all these markets that didn't talk to each other. Yeah. Each one has a different API. We started building arbitrage uh, trading programs and we saw how difficult it really was to kind of pull that stuff together. Uh, and the idea came to us to kind of literally uh, create a product to fix this problem. And so that's mm -hmm. what Xtrade is all about. It's essentially uh, creating uh, tools for uh, active traders, institutional traders primarily, to access cryptocurrency markets in a way that's uh, sort of comfortable and convenient for them um, because they're used to doing things a certain way uh, and basically ease the uh, frictions inherent uh, in dealing with these markets uh, and uh, create software and products uh, around making them better and more efficient and uh, just more consumable uh, for, for the higher uh, level uh, trader, if you will. So it is really for, because Xtrade obviously will kind of explain what it is uh, in a second, because you've got kind of a number of products there that you're looking for the institutional investor. So it really is for the kind of institu institutional investor, but we can, as traders, can we use Xtrade as well? Would we be able to use like Xtrade Pro that's coming out, we'll speak about in a second? Yes. So uh, the, the initial product of Xtrade is uh, called uh, the Fix API. Yeah. So what that is, is uh, an API that's uh, based on a FIX, FIX protocol. So the FIX protocol has been used in finance for like something like 30 years. So every every sort of trading program, every exchange, every market data provider, uh, every execution venue uh, talks to other uh, participants using the FIX protocol. It's sort of like the intermediary protocol that everybody has to use because everyone's system is built differently. And so there needs to be some level of uh, you know, a communication that everybody works with, and that's what Fix is. So in crypto, most exchanges don't have Fix. Very few do. And so what we're doing is essentially is creating a Fix API that encompasses all liquid exchanges that allows an institution to come in to get one set of market data, one feed, if you will, uh, and one 
pathway to execution without having to create over and over and over again multiple uh, API implementations yeah. for each individual exchange, which is a huge pain in the ass. Yeah. Right. Uh, and not only to create them, but to maintain them. Imagine having to maintain like you know 15 different APIs at the same time, uh, and they're all lackluster. Uh, you know, many of them don't have the right functions. They send like a cancellation before an execution, things like that. So you have to normalize that. Uh, and so the next trade fixed API will do just that. It will, uh, or it's actually doing it already. It's uh, taking all those market data feeds, all those execution feeds, and consolidating them into one feed, and then putting it in the place where somebody can connect to in the data center, so they have faster access to that. They don't have to open multiple uh, entry points all over the world. Uh, so that's sort of sort of what we're creating, and then uh, that is the backbone of what we're doing. Yep. And on top of that, we're going to put a, a trading platform that's a GUI or a graphical user interface. Uh, which means that it's the same thing, except you can trade by hand. Uh, and so we're, we're competent in the fixed API portion. We're actually on the board of fixed governance, uh, along with Connemara and Goldman Sachs and all those guys. And so we're literally creating standards uh, in the crypto working group uh, for, for the fixed protocol uh, worldwide. Uh, and so we're very competent in that space. And that's why we started there. So is there going to be a lot more exchanges? Because I know even as a kind of a single kind of trader, being myself, that I've signed up for m- must be 25 different exchanges and it's a pain in the arse just to right. even go on the sites and kind of trade them and can transfer Ethereum and kind of Bitcoin and stuff like that. So have you got exchanges on board just now with the fixed API? So uh, they don't need to be on board. Essentially what happens is we just write on top of their existing API. Right. Uh, and so and so we just, we just create a tool that somebody can access and, and open their existing account at an exchange using our API. But uh, the advantage is that they don't have to do it, do it algorithmically with, with APIs over and over and over again. They just r- basically run one connection, uh, and then we connect every everyone else for them. So it solves that technological problem and creates uh, sort of an abstraction they're looking for, uh, especially on the institutional side. Oh, brilliant! So the, the exchanges don't have to have to have to get on board with the so kind of the script that no. you've written, and it's the person, it's the user that's actually using that script. Yeah. So by and large, uh, yeah, but exchanges actually that, that we're talking to, uh, we want to work with and they want to work with us because yeah. uh, it creates partnerships where, for instance, an exchange can give us preferential execution for a large customer, uh, you know, give uh, sort of a uh, remove the throttling that they usually have to prevent sort of malicious, uh, uh, malicious uh, people invading their trading space by sending a lot of orders that aren't real, for instance, because they'll know that it's a whitelisted client that we bring in. Uh, and then they'll help that client open an account quickly, get set up, uh, and it becomes like a mutually beneficial relationship where we provide easy access for institutional um, uh, clients to a particular crypto exchange. The crypto exchange treats them well. Uh, so it kind of grows hand in hand. Everybody wins. Uh, we're also working with exchanges on the back end, uh, and I can't uh, release the news yet, but it'll be out uh, hopefully soon, where we're building uh, the fixed gateway for a major exchange. Uh, mm-hmm. So what that means is... A lot of the uh, clients of that exchange, they're already trading there. They've been trading there for many years, and they want to have a fixed API, but they don't have it at that exchange. And so we're partnering to build that for them. Uh, so these are some of the implementations that we're working with with different exchanges on a partnership basis. Uh, but by and large, we don't need uh, to basically uh, agree to you know to have a partnership. We just literally right on top of their API and uh, add it into our, our stack. But uh, everyone's been very receptive to it, of course. So what about the security for the API as well then? Because obviously that's been a kind of an issue in the past as well when we've seen even the bigger bigger exchanges having problems with the API. And um, what about the security for that? I take it as a protocol for that as well. Yeah. So uh, my partner, Serge Gulka, who's the CTO, is better versed in this uh, aspect of it. But essentially, uh, we have a, a, a whitelisted private connection to our API. So you won't be able to connect over the internet. It will be through a, a secure channel, uh, either uh, collocated at the data center that we're at, or through a VPN that's that's you know whitelisted. And so, uh, what happens is that there's very uh, point, uh, very encrypted point to point connections that people are used to connect to us. Uh, and then from there, we use our infrastructure uh, to connect to, to exchanges through, from the data centers that we are at. So it's all private lines. Uh, it's all encrypted end to end point point to point connections. Uh, and uh, the, you know, eliminates a lot of those, um, a lot of those issues that are uh, inherent with security. Essentially, we know every one of our customers. We know who they are. We know where they're connecting from, and so it's very easy for us to see if something malicious uh, is happening. Uh, and so we're able to better control that from our side. So it's going to be easier to control because you're not really catering to the kind of traders like myself, where there's going to be thousands of people, there's big, large institutional investors. So there's not going to be 
a, a huge amount, like thousands and thousands and thousands of them. You've only got kind of kind of some major clients or a lot of major clients, so you can. Well, but, sorry, yeah. So for the fixed API, it's, it's actually uh, traders, institutional traders, more than institutional investors, right. uh, and that because we're catering to active traders who arbitrage between different markets or execute sizable connection, uh, sizable orders across multiple exchanges. Uh, so, uh, for that implementation, yeah, it's going to be for the fixed API, uh, primarily those types of clients that are larger, uh, because who else would write algos and trade, you know, somebody who's a little more sophisticated who needs that service, uh, for the retail side, we, we do have X trade, uh, pro that we're releasing. Yep. And so that product, uh, is, uh, going to be over the web, that particular product, uh, as opposed to the fixed API, which is sort of an institutional product. Uh, but there'll, there'll be a high level of security inherent in that, and we'll uh, put that information out there as uh, as we get closer to the release uh, for that product. So, uh, and on the yeah. So when is the release for? Because obviously, <clears throat> obviously, I, I'm interested as an investor to see what's happening, and you're bringing on kind of institutional um, kind of traders as well. So I'm interest, interested from that point of view. But as a trader, the X Trade Pro sounds brilliant kind of ideal for me because i don't need to go to all these different exchanges and do the arbitrage myself i was going to do something like that because that's right. all kind of inherent in the xtrade pro um kind of product itself is that correct yeah so that, that'll be coming out so towards the end of the year uh we're just uh, putting a lot of the backbone infrastructure in place to support that uh and so uh that that's what we're seeing timeline wise for that and we'll have more information on that so as we get closer to that release and you've got a couple of other products as well. What are the kind of timelines for the, the other products you've got? Because you've got four, four main products, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, there's that. There's the liquidity aggregation product. Uh, and we actually prioritize a different product ahead of that, which is the dark pool product uh, yep. we're seeing uh, in the OTC uh, space. Basically, there's these large uh, market participants that are trying to sell and buy uh, each other large quantities yeah. uh, of uh, Bitcoin. For instance, and so somebody will have thousands of Bitcoin, and somebody will have millions and millions of dollars trying to buy that. And there's usually multiple intermediaries uh, in the middle between these two uh, parties, uh, and each trade is sort of like uh, bespoke. It's like you know you have to have an escrow range that everybody has to agree on. Uh, the guys in the middle make like percentage points, like single percentages, which is huge. Like in a hundred million dollar order, you're paying three million dollars, five million dollars. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Uh, and so uh, that's going to move away uh, from that setup. Uh, it's going to go more towards like electronic execution. So we're, we're creating something called X-Trade Dark, uh, which is uh, a dark pool. Now, what a dark pool is, is uh, a liquidity pool that's not public, basically people trading with each other privately. Uh, and then uh, we're working with um, uh, certain custodians that we can't really name yet uh, that are able to custody both uh, fiat uh, and crypto. Uh, and these are custodians that are not just crypto custodians, but they've been around for you know, many, many years uh, handling very large transactions in the, in the traditional uh, financial space, like uh, FX, trillions mm -hmm. of dollars. Uh, so they're able to custody and uh, execute those trades. And then we're going to basically provide the sort of the, the matching engine uh, to do so. Uh, and then the, the concept is that if uh, everyone is trading in the same sort of pool, if everyone has their money and their crypto escrowed or deposited uh, in the same location, and it's very easy to make a match without having to pay 5% or 3% to execute your $100 million order. Basically, somebody is there on one side and somebody is there on the other side, then the trade is simply done. Uh, and uh, that's really uh, you know, the point of extra dark. And then also to aggregate other liquidity from other uh, market centers into there as well. Because in traditional markets, uh, it's not like you have now with crypto. Every market is sort of like its own little liquidity point, its own little island. All liquidity is linked together. Everyone reroutes to each other. So even though it seems counterintuitive that you're like sharing liquidity, but really it's better because then you get the trade. Everyone gets an execution. Uh, and so I think crypto's kind of moving towards that where it becomes more um, sort of centralized in a way that uh, allows for execution to happen efficiently like it does in traditional markets. Um, and the thing about crypto, it's really philosophical. Everyone wants to be decentralized. Everyone wants to kind of uh, not have demand, look at their trades yeah. and you know, but but it's not realistic. A couple of reasons. One is that uh, you have to have custody. Institutional traders are the ones that bring liquidity and stability yeah. into financial markets. It's not like a bunch of retail guys, because if you have just a bunch of small retail guys, what happens is what's happening now, which is a bunch of market manipulation, is a bunch of predation, pump and dump groups on Telegram with like yeah. seventy thousand people. It's insane. Uh, so what you need to have is more stability, and to do that, you need to have a custody and clearing solution. Right. And you're seeing that now, like one, one great example is backed, which is uh, yeah. uh, the ICE uh, exchange uh, is releasing a product which is going to custody 
physical uh, Bitcoin and create uh, a futures contract that's not leveraged, that's not linked to dollars, it's linked, it settles in Bitcoin, it settles within one day. So that means is now you can actually have a broker dealer that opens an account at this exchange. It's able to trade for all of its clients and you can trade right away with other broker dealers. It basically mirrors traditional stock exchange infrastructure where all the trades settle, uh, you know, uh, end of day. So you don't need to have actually have settlement on chain. That's another problem because on chain settlement is slow. So you can't have fast trades. Uh, it's not efficient. Uh, so decentralized exchanges are certainly a great thing, but uh, I mean, right now it's less than 1% of trading volume. The, yeah. the biggest exchanges are literally like single digit millions uh, dollar wise uh, compared to like a 10 billion or $15 billion yeah. uh, trading volume. It's, it's a joke. Uh, and the reason is because one, you don't have the KYC element that's really there. Two is you don't have the fast execution engine. Uh, you know, and three is that, uh, you know, it's just, it's just not really efficient and they don't talk to each other. So you need to have central points of liquidity, central points of clearing. And I think all these exchanges are going to consolidate. I think they're going to, uh, liquidity is going to flow to where the institutional liquidity is uh, because that's where the better prices are. Uh, that's where more trading is. Uh, and that's where you're a better able to execute. And that's where the retail public is going to get better executions because the spreads will be narrower and there'll be more liquidity and crypto won't move like this. So it'll just kind of move like that. Yeah. You know? And that's so kind of the you, future. Did you see that as what happening when the institutional investors come in or the institutional, institutional traders come in, that there is going to be a more stable market? Do you see that kind of coming or do you yes, think that's still yes. a long way off or do you think it's, it's coming up for the near future? Uh, I wouldn't say near future. I would say that everyone's still very wary of crypto in general because yeah. it's sort of unregulated. Uh, there's uncertainty around that. There's uncertainty around clearing and settlement, but everyone is running to solve those problems very very quickly yeah uh and uh you know some are more proactive than others but i think at the end of the day there will be centralized jurisdictions that are credible that aren't like you know uh in some weird caribbean country yeah uh, uh you know there'll be uh registered securities exchanges uh i think uh the future is not utility tokens i think the future is security tokens yeah. uh because tokenizing real assets is where uh crypto really shines because you can now take a i don't know uh industrial park in china and create tokens around it uh, whereas before you have to have like a private equity or you know vc or some some kind of setup to do that and that opens up tokenization for uh, probably 500 trillion half a quadrillion dollars worth of real world assets and i think that's like the, the killer killer use case not ico speculation uh and so that will happen and that will happen in regulated jurisdictions and regulated markets and re regulated exchanges and that's why you're seeing a lot of these security exchanges start coming up. Uh, wow. So, yeah, that's that. Where do you see the kind of crypto market going? At the moment? Obviously, it's extremely volatile. It's, it's kind of getting boring just now because we can see the manipulation. We can clearly see the manipulation in the markets just now. Where do you see it going? Do you think, um, obviously, the SEC are going to have to get involved? The SEC has to come in. They have to kind of regulate in some way to protect the retail investor as well as the institutional investor as well. And this is where the custodial service is obviously really important as well. How long do you think before, say, for example, even talking about short term, the ETF kind of, and things like that kind of happening with the SEC? That's kind of one step they're looking. That's not well. It is a big step. It's going to be a big step for retail kind of traders as well and institutional investors. As well, where do you see it going, and how long do you think it's going to take for the the market to mature? That's kind of really what I'm asking. Well, I mean, you have uh, one of the commissioners recently stating that the SEC shouldn't be acting as a helicopter parent, if you will. Um, yeah. <laughs> she she was the main dissenter uh, in the last opinion, uh, and I think there was another commissioner who just joined the SEC that was um, probably more friendlier to crypto than than others. And so, I think slowly but surely, the SEC will become a little bit more comfortable, and there'll be more of a public outcry. Uh, you know, sort of like against the nanny state, <laughs> trying to regulate everything. Uh, and I think the ETFs will come. Uh, I don't know if they'll be uh, on September 30th, like everyone's saying. Uh, I think they're just punted up. And uh, but I think the market's already priced that in. Uh, right, right now we're in a bear market. Um, I, I really don't know when uh, it'll go up or how much it'll go up, but I think it will. Uh, I think uh, the interesting thing is that the, the, even even though everyone's focusing on this whole ETF thing, uh, it's actually not necessary because if back comes online if you can exactly. custody crypto in, in, in a clearing you know in a clearing entity in a broker dealer then everyone can easily buy crypto because it's you know uh, that that's the point right you can have a broker dealer set up you know within a regulated exchange yep. and have retail clients open accounts and buy the stuff and they'll be warehoused in custody and 
so, I mean, that alone is huge news and nobody seems to really understand that, which is crazy. Everyone's focusing on the ETF. But really, the, you know, the institutional custody uh, is what's allowing uh, a lot of these things to actually happen. Um, so I think we will have an upswing in the market uh, post all these regulatory and, and you know, kind of sort of custody developments. Yeah. Uh, probably, you know, uh, in the next uh, two years. But again, it's hard to say when and how much. And, uh, you know, uh, I think we're all, we all have to wait for the market to mature. But I think it will. Uh, I think it's inevitable. There's too many people involved now for it not to be. Definitely. Uh, you know, something that's going to move forward. There's a lot of vested interests. And it's sort of like the new space. And it's, uh, you know, we've explored, you know, less than 1%, I think, of what's possible. Uh, and that's it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just local. It's not just the U.S. tech stocks that are going up. This, is, yeah. this isn't FANG. This is worldwide tokenization of every asset in the world. Uh, traded by everybody in the world, you know, and that's that's huge. It's a huge, huge, huge. Uh, it's it's sort of creating like a worldwide economy, uh, and then that's that, there's no way that's not going to affect the price of these assets. The question is which assets and yeah. uh, what they're worth, because you know the fact that crypto goes up uh, altogether, it's all correlated. Uh, you know, I don't think that's a good thing. I think the fact that uh, the assets move, whether they're inherently uh, priced well based on their function. Uh, is wrong. I think assets should move independently based on their individual uh, value, the individual sort of use case. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think it, we have to have, we have to see these assets decouple from uh, leading indicators like Bitcoin and, and trade by themselves. And I think you'll see a lot of projects die that don't yeah. have a real use case. And you've, you've seen that already. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the ones that do have products will, will do better because people are moving past the speculative element and moving towards, like, what does this thing actually do? Instead of like, if I buy it now, it'll go up because everyone else is buying it. I think it's a sign of maturity in the market. So even though the market crashed, I think it's a good thing. Uh, it probably happened sooner than all any of us thought would happen. But uh, at, the, at the end of the day, it, it, it's a positive and things will get better. So do you see it going more with the way of the kind of stock market whereby we because I think being honest, looking at the kind of some of the cryptocurrencies just now, we're kind of looking at them and go, OK, that's worth Two billion dollars, ten billion dollars, or whatever it is worth, and then you ask yourself, is it really worth that? Is it really worth kind of ten billion dollars? Or um, you just go it's kind of crazy prices. But when we look at a stock market kind of analogy, then these kind of cryptocurrencies they wouldn't be priced mm -hmm. nowhere near um, where they are just now. Do you see it kind of going that way as well? Where we're going to have to have this fundamental um, of the actual company itself or the project itself before we can actually put a valuation on it. Look, I mean, I think at the end of the day, a lot of these projects might be worth, like Ethereum is worth $10 billion yeah. or whatever it is, because that'll be the platform that everyone is using to, uh, you know, create these smart contracts. Not because it's the best one or it's the fastest, because yeah. it's just got like a wider distribution network. Everyone's using it, de facto, you know? So, um, you know, I, I think as, as time progresses, um, you know, the valuations will converge with, you know, realities versus future value. Yeah. But if there's if there's like a strong momentum in um, uh, in the use cases, uh, you know, off the bat, uh, I think people will trade based on future value uh, initially. Uh, so, um, but you know, as far as uh, real values, uh, you know, uh, converging with uh, you know the, the prices, you're, you're seeing that now, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, I think you know, like with Ripple recently, you know, where they released that PNC is going to join the alliance, and then yeah. um, you know, you see how this price the price react. But people are just looking for sort of like the good news in the space, They're looking for real things. Uh, and I think real products with real use cases are going to be valued well because the implications of their valuations, uh, even though they seem high, they're actually low. Like the entire crypto market is worth like one fifth of Apple, you know, or, yeah. or Amazon. Uh, it's it's like, and you know, that's just like you know. Uh, I think it's crazy. I think it's going to be worth a lot more than that. I think we're looking at the trillions and trillions of uh, market cap. But again, it has to be the right, uh, the right uh, sort of use cases, and uh, you know that, that's really the key. So, do you see a lot of the projects kind of disappearing? Like, obviously, there's there's some disappeared already. Obviously, do you see a lot more disappearing? Then the cream is going to rise to the top, and these um, kind of projects have got kind of use case scenario. They've actually got products that are out there, and some of them are actually. Kind of making money as well. They're actually make, like traditional businesses, like Binance, for example. That's actually making millions of dollars per year. That's an actual product. So the company's got a use case. And it's got a brilliant team behind it as well. So do you see more and more um, of that happening as well? Well, you know, obviously, uh, yeah. you know, people are expecting uh, real value and expecting, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, actual products to be released that generate uh, actual value. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, the, the problem with the ICO space is that, like, or was, I think, I think it's a yeah. lot of it's pretty much dead, uh, is that you have uh, a company that gets, gets an exit before they start a product, before they start anything. You know, it's like, here's, here's your reward now, and then go do your thing later. You know, and it's just like the, you know, the incentives are all misaligned in that type of space. And that's why you're seeing a lot of people just say, Hey, well, I got like, you know, $20 million, you know, nobody really, you know, I don't really have to build this. I could just kind of walk away and nobody yeah. can really get me if I'm in like Malta or something, or, you know, and a lot of times they do, uh, because why not? Right. And then, yeah. and, and, and again, you can say, Oh, you know, these people are screwing everybody over and this and that, but at the same time, you have to think of it from the other side. And people that bought these tokens, right? I mean, they it was they bought it purely based on speculative nature. They don't care about the technology. They don't care. They don't, all they care is that the token is going to get listed and it'll go up, and they can sell it and they can make yep. money. Uh, so they're just and and the dangers of that are huge. And then obviously, you know, that's what happens. You know, you have people who don't need to do anything who get a bunch of money up front, and then people who just buy because they don't know anything about it, or just because it'll go up because everything else yep. is going up, and that's just like a recipe for disaster. That's why you had the crash. Uh, but again, uh, once I think yeah, I agree with you. Once you have more products that are coming out from real companies with real use cases that impact real world, um, you know, uh, real world issues, I think that's a big deal. And I think you're seeing it with uh, a lot of products that are like look back. That's like Microsoft and, uh, and Starbucks, and you know, it's like real, uh, you know, real companies that are that are doing uh, traditional things, but they're imp they're implementing uh, these technologies in their everyday business cases, and so. Uh, I think you'll see those as drivers uh, in the valuations. So going back to kind of X Trade, then obviously, do you? I think I would, if I'm being really honest, I would, because I'm in the Telegram group as well. Can I see what's going on in the Telegram group? And a lot of people don't really know what they're investing. Obviously, they bought into your ICO, I bought into kind of just after the ICO as well. But a lot of people don't know what kind of X Trade is about or um, anything really about it. They're just saying. When's it going to be listed on another exchange? When's this going to happen? When's this going to happen? And they're just looking for the speculative nature. And um, just like you said, right. do you not get pissed off and just say, listen, let us do our work. We're going to do our thing. It's going to come out and it's going to be maybe a year, two years before it really kind of matures. Does that not kind of annoy, <laughs> annoy you to some degree? No, I mean, I understand their, their position, you know, uh, obviously, uh, you know, we can't we can't talk about listings or any of that uh, stuff. Of course, uh, yeah. for, for obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, uh, look, I mean, this stuff is not overnight, right? You know, buy token and have it, you know, thirty x, and then everybody's happy. But the reality is that it takes time to build these products. It takes time to develop the infrastructure. Just to get internet and a data center it takes like a month, two months. You know, so it's all traditional work. Markets don't move as quickly as people would like, yeah. uh, and the technology implementations are not overnight. And they're not easy, and they're not simple. Um, and uh, traditional, uh, you know, I mean, building this stuff uh, is is not easy. Uh, if 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 it were, everybody would do it. So yeah. we're building something that's very serious, uh, that's being used uh, by going to be used by um, you know large players, and, and it takes time to develop these technologies and uh, to kind of build that momentum. But once you do, it becomes uh, it becomes a great use case, and uh, it becomes uh, you know a good business, uh, and so. Uh, we're mindful of, uh, you know, uh, the token situation, but also, uh, we need to build what we need, what we said we did, uh, we would build and it's going to take us time to do that and we're working towards that. Um, yeah. you know, we really have to fix API, uh, in production. Uh, we're getting the X-ray pro product out pretty soon as well as the dark. So, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we're on it. We're getting it done. So um, you don't track. So, sorry. So you don't track. Track. Oh yeah. We're on track. You're on track. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So uh, about X Trade, then obviously it's, it's catered to the kind of institutional kind of traders as well. How do you plan on onboarding the kind of institutional traders? And um, because obviously you're going to have to develop relationships, <clears throat> and obviously you've done that already to a degree. How do you plan on? Is it going to be word of mouth? Or is it going to be just a case of going out and building these relationships? I mean, we've been you know inundated with uh, uh, companies, hedge funds, and active trading groups that are basically asking us, "Hey, when is this ready? I want to trade. You know, I need to have this product in place." You know, we have just a long list of people that are already waiting to use it. Just from our personal relationships and traditional equity and FX space, from our advisor relationships, we have a you know a pretty large group of clients uh, that are ready to go uh, uh -huh. and are already using the product. Uh, and so, uh, we don't foresee uh, any issues in, in that space. Uh, and then uh, once we're, um, 
you know, so moving forward, the greater momentum, then we can actually, uh, uh, you know, begin to be more proactive in, in the, you know, in the proselytizing of the product and selling it and so forth. But uh, I think right now it's better to focus on, uh, you know, making sure that it works well. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to running around trying to, you know, basically get clients for uh, for something that could, could be better uh, in a short period of time. Yeah. So. Alex, as a CEO as well, do you kind of, uh, I don't know if, how I would kind of feel about this if I was a kind of CEO of a big company kind of like this. Do you look at the price of X-Trade just now? Uh, do you pay attention? Because obviously you're working in the background, you're doing all this kind of work um, on the kind of four products and building the relationships and everything else. Do, do you still look at the price and kind of worry or do you just go, it doesn't matter, I'm, we're working on it. It doesn't really matter about the price just now. Look, I mean... <sighs> It's not a function of price. The utility to it's a utility token to be used yep. as a payment of services on our network. Uh, we are focused on building our products, uh, and uh, you know we're not uh, looking at uh, you know whatever speculative activity occurs uh, with the token at this time. Good, good. Right, one last question on this because we've got kind of main questions, quick fire questions as well. Where do you see kind of X Trade being in say the next three to five years? Well, uh, I think we're going to be in a pretty good spot as far as being able to facilitate uh, trading and crypto exchanges uh, using our technology uh, and aggregating liquidity and being able to uh, provide value uh, and uh, sort of simplicity to uh, active traders and hedge funds. And uh, I think uh, I think there's a really, really strong need for our product in this space. Uh, I think we'll deliver it uh, and I think we'll continue to grow uh, in the next few years as the market matures. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, I've got a couple of quick fire questions for you. Sure. And this is kind of as not it was kind of crypto related, but uh, personal. It's more to get to know you as a person as well. So, sure. what's the best kind of personal development advice you've ever received from somebody, and who was it? Could be business or kind of personal um, as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, the company that I worked for before our CEO was very adamant about us like finishing things quickly. Uh, you know, d down to the last ten percent. He's like, you can do ninety percent of it, but you could just do like a hundred percent, and just like just just get it done. You know, so I always try to kind of get things done. Yeah, you know, down to the last portion, you know, because a lot of times it's easier to just, ah, you know, we'll just push this one off later. So just focusing on um, getting things done and uh, kind of breaking up products, uh, projects in a way that, you know, you start off with one, then you finish it, and you move on, then you finish it. So just keep kind of moving forward, always working and always trying to finish something before you start something else and just not to have too many balls in the air, if you will. Brilliant. So uh, just, 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 just really that is quite important, you know, because otherwise you can get lost in the shuffle. There's so much stuff going on. I know the feeling. <laughs> um, can you give us a, a kind of personal habit that you've got that contributes to your success? Obviously, you've been very successful in the last kind of 12, 15 years in your kind of working career as well. Can you give us one personal habit apart from that one you've just kind of given us, obviously? I think uh, scheduling is important, you know, just making sure your day is yeah. broken up into, uh, you know, a specific chunks where you do this, then you do this, then you do that, and you have breaks in between. Uh, just just being structured and organized is, is hugely important. I think uh, that's helped me quite a bit in my, in my life so far. Excellent. Good advice. Now, where do you see the Bitcoin price at this time next year? Tough question. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I think there'll be some institutional implementations for uh, custody and for, um, uh, you know, for sure, sort of trading capability uh, that which will directly affect the price. Uh, and I think market you know, markets obviously move cyclically in crypto and they always seem to move logarithmically. Um, so um, I, w I would say that we would be somewhere in the 10 to 20,000 range sometime next year. I know it's like a really like safe and easy prediction to make. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's, it's the only one that I could see that's realistic. Uh, I don't know how long it'll take to get there. Uh, you know, the market's not mature enough to really predict it uh, with any degree of certainty because the problem with all these crypto assets is that they don't have valuations. Yeah, they don't have. They're not worth anything ostensibly. They're worth something because people basically agree that they're worth something. Yeah, you know, exactly. Bitcoin's a store of value because people don't have a lot of Bitcoin. Uh, and there will be less as, you know, the, the difficulty doubles every four years and so forth. Um, and, you know, what, what is crypto worth? Nobody really knows. Um, and that, that's kind of the issue. So that's why, that's why the, you know, the values, you know, Ethereum goes from 1400 to like 200 in like six yeah. months, you know, it, it's insane. Uh, but uh, I, I think by and large, um, you know, the people are invested in the crypto markets. Uh, people are trading these assets. So, so that creates some stability. Uh, and I, I, I think Bitcoin over 10, 10 to 20, uh, I think is realistic next year. Uh, but again, it's highly volatile and I'm really hesitant to make those predictions. 
because anybody who makes those predictions yeah, exactly. uh, is, is not credible. Uh, any, anybody who says with a degree of certainty that Bitcoin will be X prize by Y time uh, is just trying to sell you something. Uh, you know, I, I think investments you can afford, uh, you know, trade with the amount of, that you're comfortable losing that goes down 80 percent. But it can also go up 300%, you know, so that's kind of the trade-off with crypto. And I think as long as it's that volatile, you just have to kind of treat it very carefully and treat it as a sort of a secondary asset that you invest in that's that's speculative. And don't allocate more than, you know, a small percentage of your portfolio to it. But at the same time, their, their rewards can be huge. Uh, you just have to be kind of cognizant about um, sort of what, what really something is worth. And, uh, you know, I think the, the larger... Um, the larger assets that have better use cases, yeah. uh, I think down the line are going to be the ones that do well and the ones that are just speculative are not going to do well. Uh, and we've seen that already. So that's kind of my opinion. Great answer. <laughs> Great answer. One last question I've not, um, I've just kind of thought about just now. Do you think Bitcoin is going to replace fiat currency? No. No? No, uh, Bitcoin cannot replace fiat currency. Uh, a couple of reasons. One, it's too volatile. So you bought a car for twenty thousand worth of Bitcoin. Tomorrow yeah. it's twenty five, other than the day after it's fifteen. Um, you know, so until you have stability in the price, maturity in the price, you can't have that. Uh, and then governments are always protecting your currencies. You know, so if uh, somebody, uh, if the government doesn't want, if the Russian doesn't want, or China is a better example doesn't want cryptocurrency to be used internally within their borders because they you know they control the currency, they control yeah. the population, they'll kind of turn that spigot off. So I think there'll be a patchwork of implementations. Uh, I think uh, you know Bitcoin will be usable as currency, uh, potentially, uh, as long as it's instantly converted to fiat, which is what yeah. you're seeing now. Because nobody's gonna take that risk of accepting Bitcoin and then having to go and sell it in the open market because it's very difficult. So I think uh, once you have Im implementations that allow you to convert quickly, it may be more realistic. Uh, I think the other problem is custody. Like right now, if you if you use Bitcoin, you have to download a wallet uh, and you have yeah. to, you know, keep your private key safe. And people can't do that, you know. And there's no recourse. Like if uh, you know, if you have you know Bitcoin, you know, it's worth like six grand, and then you know you lose your, your, your you know your wallet, you lose your key, you're, you're screwed. Like you're, yeah. it's it's gone, and you can't like call the FDIC and be like, hey, uh, you guys shared me for 250 k Where's my Bitcoin? They're going to tell you, to, hey, sorry, we, we, the hell is Bitcoin? Um, and if somebody steals your Bitcoin, we, what are you going to do? You know, yeah. so it's just and, and I think the mom and pop uh, retail, uh, you know, population is not ready in any way, shape or form to transact using cryptocurrency. Uh, but I think in the future, there'll be more implementations. And I think Bitcoin is going to be more of a store of value, uh, more like a digital gold. Yeah. It's bought uh, as a hedge against uh, traditional monetary insurance than an actual transaction mechanism. But uh, somebody will develop uh, something that's more akin to currency, um, a thousand percent sure of that. Uh, and it will be used uh, in a prevalent fashion, but just not worldwide and not as a unified uh, currency. I think we'll still be uh, in a reserve currency that's like the US dollar. Uh, and that'll happen. That'll continue to happen for, you know, for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's kind of my realistic opinion. Uh, I know it's not popular, but I think it's realistic. No, I think that was a brilliant answer. Thank you very much. Alex, thank you so much. I know you're a very um, busy man. Thank you so much for taking time out for this interview. And I think it's just to get um, kind of X Trade kind of more widely known as well on what it's about. I know you've done kind of interviews and that before, but I just wanted to get your kind of kind of updated view of what X Trade is. So thank you very much for your time. Really, really appreciate you. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, on the on the show, and uh, glad to always uh, be here to answer any questions you guys might have. Um, if you like to find out more about Xtrade, uh, just go to xtrade.io. Uh, uh, we'll also be at uh, a few conferences. We'll be at the uh, New York Trading Show uh, on September 26th, uh, and uh, Sergey, my partner, will be speaking. Uh, we're also going to be in Blockchain Shift uh, in Miami. Uh, I'll be on a panel there. We're also going to be uh, exhibiting. Um, and so, yeah, we'd love to uh, have you guys come out and talk to us and uh, meet us in person uh, and look forward to uh, releasing our products and uh, you know moving towards a better crypto space. Uh, if you want. Brilliant. Thanks, Steve. Best of wishes. I'm going to put all the links in the description for this as well. So all the links will be underneath this video for you to watch um, as well. And just click on the links and you'll be able to go over to Xtrade and look at the kind of shows as well that they're kind of doing. I know you're doing a lot of kind of shows now just now. So uh, once again, Alex, thank you very much. And I'll speak to you very soon. Thanks, Stephen. Take care. Have a good day. Right. Cheers, Bye. Alex.